Alexa, stop. There we go. Because we have some <laughs> folks who couldn't make it and want to see this later. So welcome everybody to the Contemporary Issues class on a warm July day. We are going to take a trip to Mars today. But I hope everybody's doing good. Do you have any announcements, things going on? How'd you like Jerry's sermon? Fantastic. He's really good. I thought I thought, so I thought it was great. He's really talented. Yeah, he has a very personable delivery style. Yeah. Next to the audience well. He's mm -hmm. not like a professor lecturing. <clears throat> it was a feeling. He, he's also an intellectual. He's very bright in the way he moved in and out of the scriptures and his thought processes were exceptional. I thought he combined all those things that we're talking about in such a good overall style. Very comfortable guy. Okay, well, if we have nothing else, let's launch on ourselves to Mars and see what okay. Ron has for us today. Ron, take it away. Okay, good to see Tom Reiner's on this morning. Tom, uh, Tom probably knows more about Mars and journey there than I do. So good to have you on, on board, Tom. A uh, little bit of background. I, of course, uh, as a kid, one of the earliest books I ever got was uh, on the planets, the nine planets. And I read those in elementary school, the little info on the planets. I also remember giving a presentation in fifth grade and we were to each give a, a presentation on one of the planets. And I drew, I wasn't given a choice, to give a presentation on the outer three planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And I went to the library, and there was virtually no information in 1960 on those three planets. There was hardly enough for me to scrap together a presentation. It was very short, and I was very disappointed. However, it did generate an interest in uh, astronomy, and uh, later, of course, uh, a trip to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, more specifically the museum uh, there, got me interested in uh, aircraft and aviation, things along that line. So that kind of led me into uh, uh, Rolling in aerospace engineering and uh, getting my bachelor's in uh, aerospace engineering. I won't pretend to know uh, everything about the journey to Mars. I'm not a uh, interplanetary mission planner, but I've picked up enough to hopefully make this uh, interesting today. So let's let's head for Mars. There's that cartoon I like for uh, anyone who hasn't seen The Far Side recently. Gary Larson, by the way, is uh, restarting some kind of a new cartoon strip. It might be a continuation of The Far Side or something new. But I like, I've always liked this uh, particular cartoon. Okay. Ron, Ron, is that what happened to Matt Damon in the movie? Did they, <laughs> did they, so like they, they thought he was dead and he wasn't, so. Oh, okay. Maybe he found a note like that. We thought you were dead. Hope you're doing good. <laughs> a couple of the uh, real Martian enthusiasts, and enthusiasts were Bob Zubrin and Dave Baker, and at least another gentleman. I think his last name was Clark. But these gentlemen have their picture in the book that you see on the screen right now, The Case for Mars, The Red Planet, why we must uh, go there. Uh, Bob Zubrin is a particularly zealous uh, enthusiast of Mars. He's very, very passionate about it. And I believe he's living in Boulder, Colorado right now. He's still uh, very much a Mars enthusiast. You know that uh, Mars has been, was at one time had somewhat of a richer atmosphere it has been stripped of its atmosphere uh, by dust storms, by uh, lack of forces to keep its gases and atmosphere intact. 
So Mars right now is a pretty des desolate place. Uh, this slide here shows a, uh, a dust storm uh, that was sweeping over the face of Mars in the summer of 2018. And it looks like one of those dust storms we see that comes across the uh, southwest. And there was a rover called uh, Opportunity that was uh, in the Perseverance Valley of Mars, and it was broadcasting and sending back information. It got caught up in this storm, which was extremely prolonged, many, many months. And when the storm dissipated, uh, it looks like the batteries went essentially dead on the Opportunity rover, and rover stopped broadcasting, and we haven't heard from it since. So dust storms are a real problem on Mars. Okay, the planet in itself. Uh, Mars is the next planet out in the solar system, Venus being the next one closer in. And Mars has a very eccentric elliptical orbit. Uh, it takes the uh, Earth, of course, 365 days to go around the sun. A Martian year is about twice as long, about 687. Earth days. Here's some uh, comparison data. Uh, Earth is not a completely circular orbit. Earth varies from 147 to 152 million kilometers distance. And actually, surprisingly, here in the Northern Hemisphere, we're actually furthest away from the sun in mid-July, right about now. We're actually closest to the sun uh, uh, during uh, January. But uh, nonetheless, we experience summer while we're a little bit further from the sun. But that's not too much of a variation, 147 million to 152 million. But look at Mars. Its average distance from the sun varies from 206 to 249. So it's a much more elliptical, non-circular orbit. It rotates at about the same rate uh, as the Earth. It's just a little more than 24 hours. It's an additional 37 minutes to rotate once. Its diameter is about the two thirds. The building may not yet be open, but our church has never been closed. God has called us to resurrect our city. And the uh, diameter is about two thirds of the Somebody's uh, system is on. Uh, the surface gravity is about 38% of Earth, meaning whatever uh, high bar you could jump here on uh, Earth, you could jump more than twice as high on Mars. The pressure at sea level, the standard sea level pressure, is 1,000 millibars. Uh, on Mars, the air pressure is only and this is an important one to remember, three millibars in the lowlands, that's only, that's, that's only three tenths of 1%, and 10 to 15 millibars in the highlands. So there's virtually no atmosphere, just a little bit uh, less than what, even in the highlands, there's only uh, 1% the atmosphere of Earth. So it's got a very, very, it's got about the same tilt as uh, the Earth. So that gives uh, Mars four seasons, just like the Earth. We've learned a lot by uh, some of the radar mappers and the uh, various rovers we have going around Mars. It's got a lot more iron oxide on the surface. Mars, and uh, of course called the Red Planet, and uh, we now are pretty confident there are some icy aquifers down in Mars. Of course, the big question is where are they, how extensive are they, and how concentrated of a mother load of water are they? But there's a, a lot of hope now that we're going to find some reasonably large ice pockets on Mars that we can perhaps use. 
looking at the Martian atmosphere, uh, of course, there's dust storms at the surface. When I say the surface, those dust storms can extend upwards of uh, 24, 25 miles high above the Martian surface. Uh, there are water ice clouds higher up in the atmosphere, so there is some ice, some water in the atmosphere. There are carbon dioxide, frozen carbon dioxide, or dry ice clouds, and then there's a high stratosphere. But still, it's a very, very thin atmosphere. And that's kind of bad news for trying to land on Mars, because it means you don't get much friction, and parachutes don't work very well. They work somewhat, but the atmosphere is so thin that parachutes are minimal in their effect, effect in slowing you down. So you have to use a lot of rocket power to uh, slow you down. On the right here, we show one of the Mars uh, landers used a big uh, set of airbags to uh, protect it and just went bouncing in and then bounced across the surface, uh, relying on the airbags to uh, break the uh, collision momentum speed as it contacted the surface of Mars. And then we have a picture of the famous uh, SpaceX booster recovery here on Earth, which uh, was really a pioneer in uh, recovering a booster and using uh, a reignitable rocket engine to slowly recover the booster and slowly bring it down on a raft out there in the ocean. So unfortunately, 50 years ago, we thought we could parachute our way down to Mars or use some kind of a glider. But now we know pretty well you need a good bit of rocket power uh, coming out your butt as you land on your uh, aft end to uh, slow you down to land on Mars successfully. Here's a European Space Agency uh, lander. Uh, and it did use some parachuting, but it also needed uh, quite a bit of uh, retro rocket. All right, one of the nice things about Earth, in fact, more than nice, almost essential to our survival, is there's a tremendous uh, magnetic field around the Earth. And uh, this magnetic field extends well, well out far beyond the surface of the Earth even it envelops the uh, space station. And this magnetic field protects us from uh, the solar flares and high energy particles coming off the sun and streaming through space. That means our solar radiation exposure uh, is uh, greatly reduced uh, by living here on Earth and being protected by both our magnetic field and our ozone layer. The bad news is Mars doesn't have much of a magnetic field. Here's a picture. Uh, they've used uh, magnetometers to measure uh, the magnetic field of Mars, and it's kind of just a little scramble jumble. It's not strong. It doesn't extend out terribly far, and uh, the magnetic dynamo that used to operate inside of Mars apparently at one time enveloped Mars with a very powerful and extensive magnetic field that helped protect its atmosphere. As that internal planetary uh, dynamo died out, it killed the, the Mars magnetic field to a great extent and was one of the key factors in allowing the planet, planet's uh, atmosphere to be stripped away. So that's bad news. Bad news in terms of uh, the Martian surface is still bombarded pretty heavily by uh, high energy solar particles and things coming off the sun and streaming through space. So that's gonna make it tough on people trying to land or live on Mars. Uh, because they don't have that wonderful Earth magnetic field protection. All right, uh, as you look at the orbits of Earth and Mars, again, Mars travels around the sun twice as fast. 
Uh, there's an astronomical distance called an AU, an astronomical unit. It's 93 million miles. It's the average Earth's distance from the sun. And so as we measure the distance between Mars and the Earth uh, in the years 2014 to 2061, measured in AUs, we see that uh, the distance between our planets varies quite a bit depending on what year it is. So here we are at the year 2020, and we see that we're pretty darn close to Mars. We're only uh, a little more than four tenths of an Earth orbit, Earth uh, uh, distance from the sun, distance from Mars. So we're fairly close to Mars right now. If we wait till 2027, we see that the distance to Mars will almost double, not quite. But uh, you have to take this on, into account when you plan missions. You want to try to plan a mission when you are potentially closer uh, to the planet. So I've heard that uh, some of the Martian missions are uh, the year 2035, 2037 is thought to be maybe uh, a good time to send people out to Mars. Ron, do you mind taking questions during your presentation? Uh, yeah, let's, let's stop right now after this next sl slide. This okay. shows the uh, orbit of the Earth and the orbit of Mars. And you really have to time when you do your launch. If you look at this graph, it says Earth at date of spacecraft launch, Mars at date of spacecraft launch. See the blue dot and the red dot? Well, there's a couple of them on here, but you have to very precisely launch to intercept Mars uh, at the best time. Not only at the best time, but you have to <clears throat> control how much propellant you need to get out there. If you launch at a bad time, it can take triple, quadruple, an order of magnitude more propellant to, uh, to make the journey. Uh, if you launch at an optimal time, you can greatly, greatly reduce the amount of time it takes to get out to Mars. So unlike a mission to the moon, where the moon's almost the constant distance from the Earth, uh, you have to really, really carefully plan when you launch to Mars. You've got to do it at the right year, the right month, and you have to, uh, like shooting a duck, uh, aim in front of the duck if you're going to get a hit on it. And we have to very carefully do orbital analysis to know when to launch. One more thing, we think on Earth, you know, we think we drive a car and we think how much fuel it takes to go from here to Kansas City. But once you head for Mars, if you go there too fast, if you accelerate the spacecraft up to an ultra high velocity and try to get to Mars really quick, you uh, have to expend a lot of fuel braking. There's no easy way to break in space. You can't, like Fred Flintstone, drag your feet on the pavement. You have to potentially expend enormous amounts of rocket fuel to slow yourself down. So uh, propellant management and knowing when to launch, how to use the slingshot effect of Earth's gravity, things like that to get there are extremely important. So let's uh, see if there's any questions out there. Well, I'll start off, Ron. I'm sure there's more questions, but what, why is Mars a good candidate to colonize instead of the moon, which is probably closer, right? Okay. Uh, there's more, there's a richer diversity of mineral resources there. And uh, it's got a little more atmosphere than the moon. At least there's, there's the potential to take some of the 
ice under the surface of Mars and produce some oxygen. <laughs> However, I wouldn't, we'll talk about it more as, as in this talk, but uh, it's still a very, very difficult venture. Living on Mars is uh, not simplistic, but there are at least, a, there's at least some uh, Tom, go ahead. Okay, Tom, go ahead. Well, Tom, I, go ahead. I, yeah, just, just wanted to say that uh, with the launch, the, uh, the delay of the launch now for the uh, rover going to Mars, there's a launch window coming up very, very, well, the launch window actually closes kind of at the end of this month, end of July, and then you have to wait 24 months for another launch window to open up, just as a practical example of what it is you're talking about with that, uh, with this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, view that you have up here. So this, it's rather important to get that off here in the next in the next few weeks, or they'll have to wait two years to do it again. And picking a, a launch time, uh, what is the shortest period to get from Earth to Mars? About six months. Uh, if you go like a bat out of hell and use an incredible amount of propellant and go to top speed, you can get out there in six months. The bad news is. As you accelerate your vehicle to such a phenomenal speed, you need to have a huge amount of fuel on board to do the braking maneuver. Okay, that's good. And so for that reason, nobody thinks that uh, getting out there in six months is the best way to go. You wanna go a little bit slower, uh, like take a year to get there, uh, so that you don't need so much fuel in the braking and slowing down uh, part of the uh, maneuver. Thank you. Okay, now comes the big question, why should we go to Mars? Well, there's tremendous interest in uh, finding signs of life there. If we can find conclusive proof that there was or is life on Mars, it will pretty much lock in and tell us that life has evolved uh, elsewhere in the universe. And there's a almost certain probability that there's life, and hopefully intelligent life, many places in the solar system. So Mars is a, a, a great place to make that first search. Uh, it's the only location in the solar system within reach of humans that has water and other minerals. Uh, the moon is too sterile. And it would give uh, humankind tremendous uh, unifying pride and a great goal. So those are some of the reasons we uh, want to go to Mars. Now here's why we maybe don't want to go to Mars. It would take at least a trillion dollars in current day funds. That's a, an absolute minimum. And a 25 year commitment. It would probably take international cooperation and funding. Although the United States could go it alone, uh, we'd have a better chance of being able to pull this off if we get the European Space Agency, uh, Canadians and some other people to join in with us. So a trillion dollars is uh, a lot of money. Although I guess you could argue we, we spent a trillion dollars on the coronavirus uh, epidemic funding already. Okay, the, the challenges, uh, Mars has got little atmosphere, no surface water, no ozone layer or magnetic field to protect it. Uh, you need a significant fuel burn to do the entry. And the break away from the planet with 38% of the Earth's gravity, you still have to use a pretty good rocket burn. So you need to burn a lot of rocket fuel to slow yourself down to land on the planet. And you need a good bit of rocket fuel to get a break away and take off again. So you've got to land on Mars with uh, a lot of fuel. Uh, 
we're hopeful that we can do what we call in situ resource exploration. Drill down and find some of those mother loads of water and some concentration of desired minerals. We have the medical challenges, and this is a real serious one. We know from people that have uh, stayed on the space station, and uh, there are several astronauts who have been on the space station and have stayed up to a year, and some of the issues are kidney stone formation, bone loss, and muscle loss. There also appears to be some cardiovascular system deterioration. Your heart gets lazy. Uh, out there in that zero gravity. The immune system seems to get weaker. Your skin seems to lose some of its uh, characteristics and your nervous system uh, can deteriorate. There seems to be something called the neural ocular syndrome where your vision can get impaired. And of course, the, again, the decline in your immune function. Uh, you're much more likely to be uh, hit by the coronavirus if that infection ever gets to the space station. You're exposed to galactic cosmic rays and solar flare high energy particles. And then of course there's the human isolation. Right now they're thinking the mission would be about three years, a year to go there, a year to stay on the planet, and a year to come home. And uh, the psychological effects from being in a confined environment for that period of time uh, can be pretty tough. Just on the space station, uh, we've learned a lot. Uh, they think now the mission would be about 1,100 days, so you need uh, 1,100 days of oxygen and water, and they know from the space station experience that the astronauts need about a gallon per day. And that gallon means the space station has to recover the urine from the astronauts, put it through a processing system to recover the water. Uh, they've got to recover the cabin, cabin humidity condensate. I don't know all the techniques for that, that but as water vapor uh, condenses on the surfaces inside the space station, they have to try to recover some of that water. Uh, they recover some of the water from inside the, the crew members' suits, and the current uh, space station system recovers and recycles about 90% of the water. So you really have to conserve and protect your water. Uh, oxygen. Right now on the space station, uh, the system they have recycles carbon dioxide exhaled by the astronauts back into oxygen with 42% efficiency. That's not a terribly high number. They figure for a mission to Mars, they need to get the uh, oxygen recovery system rate up to 75% or higher. And of course, you definitely need a backup and spare system. Minus oxygen, you're dead in minutes. There's a great uh, system going out on the uh, rover that's going to be launched to Mars, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. It's got a system called MOXIE. And they're going to test a small MOXIE system uh, on Mars uh, a year or so from now as that spacecraft gets out and lands on the surface. Moxie is going to suck in carbon dioxide, uh, use solid oxide electrolysis, and produce oxygen. It's incredibly important that Moxie work because carbon dioxide is 96% of the gas uh, in the Martian atmosphere, and Moxie has got to work to make oxygen. If not, if Moxie doesn't work, and I'm confident it will, quite frankly, we would have to take enormous tanks of oxygen out to Mars. Uh, so MOXIE is a key part of uh, the Martian mission. 
Any questions? Ron, do we, do we have a rocket now of the size necessary to get uh, man and all of the equipment needed to, to Mars? Or do we need a bigger rocket than what we currently have? Uh, well, the answer is, yeah, we pretty much have some on the, on the design table and, and big enough now. The key is not to try to do it all in one burst. We're going to do that. What you do is uh, put, a, put a, an orbiting space station around the moon and have that as an assembly point and, and make several missions out to that lunar space station. And you assemble your big vehicle out there at the moon space station uh, with several cargo ferry trips back and forth to Earth. And only when you get that big guy assembled out there at the lunar space station do you send it off to Mars. So yeah, we've got the launch capability. Thank Here's you. some pretty blurry pictures, but they're kind of historic. The picture on the left is before, the picture on the right is afterwards, and this was a pretty clear sign that there was erosion in a gully on Mars, and they think this is pretty solid evidence that there was a subsurface exposed uh, ice aquifer uh, on the side of a mountain, shall we say. It was leaking out some uh, melted uh, ice and eroding a gully. So there's now some pretty solid evidence and we've got good confidence that yes, there is water on Mars. There's some in the atmosphere and there's some subsurface. Of course, it's important that we find some big mother loads, just like drilling a well. We can't send astronauts out there hoping to drill 40 feet deep and find a gusher of uh, water, frozen water, and then find out it's, uh, it's a mile deep and there's only a teeny bit of it. We've got to get, we've got to find some really good ice aquifers out there. Also, good old SpaceX. Uh, SpaceX in 2018 says they intend to uh, send a mission out there and mine the water from subsurface water ice and uh, produce and then store uh, that, that uh, hydrogen and oxygen from that uh, water. So uh, right now, they're, they're pretty confident now with this Sabatier reaction. Carbon dioxide plus hydrogen uh, can produce methane and water. So we're now really hopeful that we can produce oxygen from the CO2, the carbon dioxide of the atmosphere. And if we can get down to that frozen water, uh, we can uh, dissociate the uh, water into hydrogen and oxygen. So with hydrogen and oxygen and carbon, we can make methane, which is a rocket fuel, and, and have oxygen, water, and methane. And so now this is the big hope. We can uh, create the oxygen, the methane, and the uh, hydrogen from Martian materials and not have to haul all that stuff out there, which makes the mission exorbitantly difficult and expensive. So there's, there's pretty good hope now uh, that we'll be able to do the quote, in situ uh, generation of rocket fuel and oxygen. If we go out to Mars uh, right now, we'd find there's at least six orbiters going around the planet. And there's at least two, oper two operational rovers right now. We lost a couple of them because of the big Martian dust storm. And the, this summer's an exciting time for a launch of missions. There's no less than three missions uh, due to be launched uh, this summer. 
The Chinese have a mission, and they're trying to do three things in, on their first mission. They're going to try to do an orbiter, a lander, and a rover all in one mission. And nobody's ever tried to do all three of those things in one bold venture. The Chinese are going to try it. The United Arab Emirates have a craft called Hope that they're putting in orbit. And then, of course, our Perseverance rover with 23 cameras, the MOXIE oxygen generator, and a bunch of instruments is due to launch again, as Tom mentioned, hopefully this month. So there's a, a quick picture of what the Chinese are trying. The Chinese have a very aggressive uh, space program. They're trying for a triple play. And there's the uh, gizmo we're sending out to Mars, which includes, if you see that, if you look at that picture on the right, a Mars helicopter uh, that can hopefully lift off and fly at least a little distance. I'm intrigued by the aerodynamics with a pressure, an atmospheric pressure on Mars of only three to 15 millibars. And again, Earth has a thousand millibars pressure. I'm intrigued that they can generate enough lift uh, from those whirling blades to get it off the ground. But they're doing some testing and some near vacuum, uh, vacuum space tunnels. And they're, uh, I think they're fairly confident that they can spin those rotors fast enough to lift a, at least a very, very light vehicle up to do some uh, uh, aerial exploration around Mars. But Perseverance, the picture you see there, is uh, pretty doggone cool. Uh, it's loaded with instruments, loaded with cameras, and uh, will be fantastic if it can successfully land and uh, explore Mars. Okay, let's see. It's about it's, not, it's about ten after. We're going to quickly look at what we think now might be the overall uh, Martian uh, mission combination. We will probably put something together called the Gateway, which is a human space station orbiting the moon. And that's going to be our big, uh, shall we say, extraterrestrial uh, assembly point to collect all this fuel, astronauts, uh, pieces and parts to assemble the mission to send out to Mars. Uh, the Gateway has got a bunch of different modules, and already some of the uh, international partners are promising to do pieces uh, for this uh, moon orbiting gateway. There's a, a crude sketch showing some of the pieces, some of the rooms of the gateway. Then there's the vehicle itself, the deep space transport that would uh, head on out there, and it, it would also be multi-modular and multi-piece. Phase three of the plan to go to Mars, you first assemble the vehicle in the moon orbit, get all the pieces, the, uh, the DST and the, uh, the fuel cells and all that, and then you head off to Mars, and the first mission out there is just to loop around Mars and come back, not to try a landing. And for, for that matter, first time out there to make it an unmanned mission. So you don't have people sitting on a, a vehicle for a couple of years and not even getting to land. So this phase of the mission, phase three, would just be to send an autonomous uh, uh, deep space transport out there unmanned and have it return. So uh, here's another picture of the uh, deep space transport. This one actually says uh, phase three might be, might have some people on it. There's the deep space transport living space. Again, it's a multi-modular craft. And uh, at least that module would have some reasonable living space. Phase four would be to actually go to Mars and set, start to set up uh, tanks and storage tanks and uh, set up these uh, 
drills and chemical plants to try to start generating and creating oxygen, propellant. Uh, they have rover vehicles. Uh, here are, here's one of the uh, initial concepts for a rover vehicle to explore around the planet. And there's some detail on it. I, I, I've titled this Inspired by uh, Lawn Service Mower. It looks like a giant lawnmower, doesn't it? But you can see uh, this might be a vehicle to go uh, driving around Mars and doing a lot of exploration out there. Uh, we need a lot of good propulsion technology. There's something called uh, uh, xenon hull uh, thruster systems that are pretty important. And uh, there's also uh, in Bob Zubrin's book, uh, Bob Zubrin talks about he'd like to see us develop a nuclear rocket engine, uh, which would cut down on the need to carry so much uh, propellant. Of course, that's a pretty uh, difficult undertaking, but Bob ended up getting a uh, degree in uh, a PhD in nuclear engineering. And I know he's still enthusiastic about uh, uh, a nuclear rocket engine to help the cause. But we don't need a nuclear rocket engine to pull it off, but it would be a nice thing to have. And here's the, uh, the grand finale system, as I, I call it. Uh, we uh, use the space launch system to deliver, to deliver payloads to the, uh, the moon space station. You start assembling the deep space gateway vehicle and the Orion and the crew modules and all this stuff uh, there in the moon space station. You, you break away from the moon and head for Mars. You spend, uh, it, this drawing shows, uh, a 100 to 200 ton uh, system heading out to Mars. You land on Mars, uh, you send down a 20 to 30 ton payload. Uh, you spend uh, about a year on Mars. Now remember one of the reasons you can't or won't come back right away is uh, you've got to wait for Mars and Earth to get in the proper orbital positions to make the return uh, viable. If you try to do it at the wrong time, you potentially don't have enough fuel to get back. You've got to wait for one of these windows of opportunity to get back from Mars. And that, of course, makes the mission a lot more dangerous. Uh, unlike the moon, which you can uh, depart virtually at any time to go back to Earth, uh, not so with Mars. You've got to wait for one of these windows and waiting for a year, or, or if you miss that window, waiting another year or two, uh, could be real bad news, especially if you're having a medical emergency or something has happened and you're running low on oxygen. Uh, you unfortunately need quite a bit of propellant to break away from Mars with 38% of the gravity of Earth. You need a great communication system. Uh, I've got to look up what the uh, timeline is to get a, a communications from Mars. Let's see. It, it takes, what, a, about eight minutes for uh, light to get from the Earth to, uh, from the sun to the Earth. And that means it would take, yeah, four to four minutes or so to get, uh, communications to Mars. But we also need a lot of other pieces. We need uh, surface utilities, power systems, uh, mining systems, a lot of chemical systems that work successfully. You need some uh, rovers, some Fred Flintstone uh, vehicles out there to pedal around the surface. You need uh, equipment and uh, consumables and food. It's pretty likely that you would send enormous stores of some of these things out to Mars ahead of time. Send out a uh, propellant generator, have it do the drilling and start up and start filling tanks and only send your human mission out there 
once you had confirmation that all the supplies had successfully landed and all the systems out there on Mars were working and were creating uh, the propellants and the oxygen and the things you need. Yeah, so you if can, I, quote, pre stock the planet with a lot of the things. Yeah, if I may, Ron, you're yeah. right. It's, it's uh, the communication delay is from four to 20 minutes about depending on whether you're close to Mars or in opposition, if the Mars and Earth are on, uh, are on opposite sides of the sun, it's about a 20 minute delay <clears throat> for communications. Okay. And you're right, every, every uh, architecture that I've seen always had most of the supplies, all of the supplies were pre-positioned -pre before they launched anybody uh, towards Mars. So all the, everything is already there before they would ever launch someone towards Mars. Yeah. And of course, one of the big fears is a medical emergency. You know, what do you do if you get appendicitis? Uh, you're, in, you're in a heap of hurt. Uh, we can, you can break away from the moon and get back in several days. It's still, you, you can't get back as quick as you'd like. But with Mars, uh, wow, to try to, try to wait a year to get back. If you've got a serious medical condition where you need surgery or something, uh, it could spell uh, the end of your life if you encounter a really serious medical emergency out there on Mars. Ron, are you ready for more questions yeah, and questions. discussion? Yeah, we're done. We've got the last slide here, so fire away with questions. Uh, we've never had anybody die in space. What would they do if somebody died in space? What they do? How would they dispose of the body? Or, uh, that's a good, uh, obviously, as, as a body, it would decompose because of oxygen in the, in the crew compartment and start introducing uh, uh, toxic contaminants to the atmosphere. So you'd, I guess, have to try to seal the body up in an airtight bag. And uh, even then it would be, the bag would explode from uh, potentially a generation of uh, toxic gases from the decomposing body because there's enough oxygen and water in the body to continue the decomposition process. So you, so you may have to torpedo the body out of the spaceship and <laughs> send them on their final journey. Do you, do you perceive of them, uh, do you perceive of them uh, trying to get a medical facility there and send some uh, doctors up there eventually? Uh, you'd certainly, you'd think you'd want a few people in the crew that had medical capabilities. I know in World War II, there was at least one instance on a US submarine in the Pacific where a guy developed appendicitis and a pharmacist mate and another person with some medical capability performed a very successful appendectomy uh, on, a, on a person uh, in the Pacific. And neither of the two, quote, surgeons were trained surgeons. Yeah. They just went by uh, uh, the medical book. Of course, the appendix is uh, readily available on the surface of the, the body compared to uh, yeah. diving deep for you know, heart surgery. Yeah. Um, we got about 10 minutes left. Ron, I'd like to ask, what's really driving this desire to go to Mars? Is it more than scientific ambition? Is it really wanting a place for us to go if we destroy the Earth in any way? I don't, I don't see the political pressure that was on the Apollo program to get to the moon first. I don't see a as much political pressure to get to Mars first. The bottom line is the cost per person right now of getting a person to Mars and sustaining a person on Mars is so exorbitantly high. Uh, right now, with the technology I see for the next several decades, 
I don't see an affordable uh, prospect of putting a substantial colony on Mars. When I say substantial, you know, a hundred people or so, I think the cost would just be exorbitant. Yeah. If, if I may, uh, I actually had the opportunity to work for a time on a, uh, a Mars architecture, a man Mars architecture at Raytheon. And uh, unfortunately, all of these various architectures have their own demise built into them. Every one of them always had the majority of the supplies pre-positioned uh, before you'd ever launch to begin with. And to be able to do that, to be able to get all that stuff to Mars set up and uh, put in place and all that kind of stuff takes a tremendous amount of remote capability and like that. So what you've already done on Mars before you ever sent someone, you've already demonstrated and created a tremendous amount of remote capability. So why bother send a human? Because everything that you could do with that remote capability uh, anything you could do with humans, you're already done with that remote capability. So it makes no sense at all ever to send anybody to Mars for any reason. There's no political will to do that. There's no way you're going to spend trillions of dollars. And so the whole mission to Mars, it's a wonderful thing to think about. Think about all the cool technology, but there's no way we'll ever do that. Particularly with all the bandwidth and capability that we've already demonstrated, Anything that you can do on Mars, you can do much better without humans. You can do it much better remotely. So there's no reason whatsoever, scientifically, politically, any reason to ever send anyone to Mars. Never, we'll never go there. It's a waste of time and money to send man to Mars. <laughs> Studying Mars is a wonderful thing. No man. So this may be a dumb question, but are we going to try to claim part of uh, Mars or other countries going to try to claim the territory? I, I've i heard of a lunar agreement that nobody's going to claim the moon, but I don't know if there's any international agreement on uh, people trying to claim the planets. Uh, no. Okay. I'm not sure of the legal agreements. When my daughter was in junior high school, she came home one day and her, the teacher told her that by the time she was an adult, uh, people would be living on the moon, okay? And I, I explained to my daughter, Beth, I said, you know, we can, we can theoretically build a gold highway from here to Las Vegas. <laughs> Uh, if we extract almost all the gold in the in the world and build that highway, but I said, but it cost is uh, makes it impractical. And uh, right now, uh, the cost is so exorbitant. Uh, I I I I can see Tom's uh, uh, viewpoint very strongly, and. Uh, Again, I, I, I met Bob Zubrin, and Bob is absolutely zealous that humans must break away from this planet and learn to go elsewhere. Uh, but right now, the monetary barrier is so huge that uh, I don't see it right now. Now, maybe 100 years from now, and I won't be around. Maybe there'll be uh, technologies and stuff that uh, open up the window. But right now, it, it doesn't look like it's a near-term viable uh, idea. So interesting. To what end uh, did he ever did he say that we needed to go to Mars? What what is the what is the purpose? Uh, basically, uh, Bob in his book talks about the. Uh, it's, it's kind of a religious uh, feeling within him that mankind must uh, break away from the planet. It, it's, it's just kind of a, a religious feeling. I, go ahead and get his book. Uh, it mentions, uh, I, 
It mentions Bob French in there. Now, did Bob go to our church for a little while? Is that the same French that's uh, a good friend of Don Dutter's? They attended our Sunday school class. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, not sure if that's the same sure. French or not. Not sure. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Ron, with China being a superpower, greeting getting greater power. It, what is it doing in space programs? The Chinese have a very steady uh, resolve to continue to improve their space exploration cap capability. I don't know if they have announced any man Mars uh, visions, but they're certainly sending this first spacecraft out there to, to plan a rover. But the Chinese have uh, a very sustained space plan. Unlike us, where we tend to go forth in burst of almost politically inspired steps forward, and then we, we take it easy for 10 years, and then we get a burst of energy, uh, the Chinese seem to have better long-term sustained efforts on things. And they're certainly uh, doing things in space and we can expect them to uh, improve their capabilities in the next century. We've got about three minutes left. Ron and, and uh, how long before we're going to have tourists going into space? Buy a ticket and at least go orbit around Earth. <laughs> uh, I've got to research that, but I think that's maybe as close as a couple years now. Really? Well, there uh, actually uh, suborbital flights are already uh, tickets to suborbital orbital flights in SpaceX are already being being sold. Okay. But that's just, that's not orbital. That's just uh, getting to space and coming back down again via, I'm trying to think of the name of the, of the spaceship that uh, Elon Musk has provided already. Yep. Yep. So How much is the ticket, Tom? Uh, uh, more than our Sunday collection. I suspect <laughs> it's somewhere on the order of perhaps half a million dollars of that kind of thing. Okay. The earliest I've heard for a, a mission to Mars using this uh, four-phase concept. I don't think there's anybody that felt we could pull it off before a launch in 2037. But that's assuming no major technical hurdles or uh, financial delays. Right. That means uh, it's gonna be, yeah, for a lot of us, uh, our lives are going to end before. Uh, yeah, we'll, who, who knows? But 2037 was a most optimistic guess. I, I would think realistically, maybe 2045 or something like that might be, uh, or 2050, more probable. But who knows? With enough political will and, and money, uh, we might be able to pull off a 2037 mission to Mars. Okay, we're over time. Any final questions for Ron or Tom, our engineers? A big thank you. Very interesting. Very interesting, yeah. Very interesting, yeah. Thank you, Ron. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, Ron and thank Tom. You. Yeah, thank we you very much, Ron. That was good. Okay. What's up next week, do we know? Next week in our Harvey. class here is Reverend Harvey March talking about 10 democratic principles we can all agree on. So we're going to venture back into politics That's next good. week. Yeah, interesting. Is that with a small D? What, Jim? Is that with a small D? Right, yes. <laughs> small D. Well, everybody have a good week. Thanks for joining us. We'll Bye. see you next week. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Bye-bye. Have a good week. You too.